The grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Go and be seated at this time. I was uh, asked a couple weeks ago to do uh, a preschool chapel for our New Day preschool here, wonderful preschool that we have, on the topic of don't judge, which was hard for this pastor. Um, Now, on the one hand, those words of Jesus are some of the most favorite words of Jesus for those who actually don't want to follow Jesus, right? Because in our day, in our mental climate, they're generally twisted to mean something like, do whatever the heck you want, don't say one thing is good, more good or more right or more righteous than another. But even a four-year-old kind of knows that's BS, right? Uh, Because what do we teach four-year-olds? We teach them to do what's right, and, um, and we encourage them to stand up for what is right. Now, we don't, t- now we discourage tattling just to get someone else in trouble or for whatever reason, but when, but when a four-year-old sees something wrong happening or someone hurting themselves or others, we want them to make a judgment and let somebody know so that it can be stopped. So... So on the one hand, we're certainly not to go around sniping each other, being cruel to each other, crushing and condemning each other. We aren't to go around making enemies, but we are to go around helping, <clears throat> praying for, and at times even stopping evil. That is deplorable. And that's a tough lesson to teach a four-year-old, right? And a 40-year-old. <laughs> and an 84-year-old. Now, in... in Scripture today, or in our reading this week from chapter 17 of the story, we see how the nation of Judah was judged by God to the nation of Babylon. Um, And and we're talking a physical destruction. Their cities, homes, businesses, leveled. We're talking an economic destruction. I mean, fields burned, businesses obviously torn and down and burned as well. We're talking a religious destruction. The temple was gone. There would be no more of the feasts and celebrations in that place. We see a social destruction. Communities, families ripped apart. Most of the people ended up being taken off into exile. A few stragglers stragglers left behind to make sure it didn't end up looking like a Mayan civilization where the jungle just takes over, right? So their hopes, their dreams, their homes, gone. I mean, gone. Uh, They were taught a brutally painful lesson that is to be a warning, was to be a warning for all who saw it then and all who see it now, that what you, what you do about God matters. You know, what you believe matters. What, uh, how you act from that belief matters. Those actions, those beliefs, those words, even those thoughts and attitudes have consequences. Here and now, and God tells us even for eternity. Now, um, Judah was not surprised Remember? I mean, they, the, the lesson had been there when the northern kingdom was wiped out just a few generations before. And prophet after prophet after prophet were sent to proclaim warning, to plead, to demonstrate, telling them what would happen if they stuck with their own way and their own truth and their own life. And they ignored them over and over. Our gospel reading today When Jesus is coming or in Jerusalem, struggling with still the hard-heartedness of its people, even in that day, and he says, I have longed, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you were not willing. You were not willing. This short but profound lament by Jesus shows how he, in his day, was trying to draw them back. How God, in 
in, in the days leading up to this destruction of Jerusalem was trying to draw the people back. And, and, and they tell us that God is actually, and Jesus especially, was trying to save us from something. You know, from something and for something, but in this case today, we'll focus more on from something. And this from has various words for it in Scripture. None of them are all that pleasant. Jesus talks about it all the time, probably more than any other author in Scripture combined. Um, and that's judgment and the hell that follows. It's probably the least popular doctrine of Christianity, right? Right? And before you completely tune it out, um, and ignore my words, following words to potentially your peril, consider that the most loving, self-sacrificing, the author of life and faith, the defender of the weak and the broken, the one who freely offered us in a horrific death on the cross, spoke very seriously about this topic over and over again in his ministry. And so to reject hell's reality is to reject Jesus and what he came to do for us. And, 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 so, uh, and to say hell is the mean teaching of Christianity, um, I think is an indication that our hearts are still rebelling against God's justice and righteousness. And if that's the case, just listen for a few moments, and maybe we can step through a few things today. Now, Tim Keller, a um, popular author, pastor, wrote an article several years ago, and I want to just bring out a few of the things that he kind of, he mined out of Scripture, uh, you know, so, so uh, the first is this, that hell, this idea of hell, judgment, shows us how infinitely dependent we are on God for everything. I mean, I mean think about this. Last week, we learned about Hezekiah. And this is just only like a few years, a few decades before the fall of Judah. How quickly they forgot the lesson of Hezekiah. Do they think that it was their strength that was saving them from the superpowers that were around them. I mean, Judah was the size of San Joaquin County. And Assyria and Babylon were massive. Right? I mean, did they think that it was their strength, their cleverness, their wisdom that would save them? And, and, and what we learn from Hezekiah is if God's people humble themselves and pray, if God's people repent of their idolatry, he can and does save. But when we don't, he often just allows the natural consequence to occur. And in that day and age, as even today, the bigger wipes out the smaller. You know, and, and, and we're not... We're not any different. I mean, you know, today, how often we forget of God's, what's often referred to as God's just common grace. Jesus puts it, you know, in the sense of God sends rain, right, on the righteous and the wicked. It benefits both. Every breath we take, every bite of food we get, our work, our relationships, these are just God being gracious to people whether they like him or not. Whether they want him or not, whether they acknowledge him or not, he is just that good. All the time. And, and yet, we can then maybe forget that there's a reason for these gifts. I mean, every day he delays our judgment is so that we can repent. And we can be with him for all eternity. If we intentionally continue to push back against the grace of God, he is trying to offer us in this life. God honors that. God honors that for eternity. And quite frankly, nothing then can be worse than being removed from that grace. I, I mean, think about this. Um, hell, uh, Jesus tells us, is actually, it wasn't, it wasn't that God said, ooh, I'm going to make a wonderful universe and I'm going to create hell just to be mean. That's what he did. He tells us actually here that that was actually prepared when the devil and the angels rebelled. And what do you do? 
when no one wants to, when they don't want to be in your presence anymore. You create a place that's not in his presence, which by definition is hell. By definition is hell. And so, and that kind of brings us to the next point. Hell it unveils the seriousness of just living life our own way for ourselves. If you li live life for yourself and apart from God, not needing or wanting his way, his way or his truth or his life, he'll give you what, what he'll actually give you want and nothing could be more horrifying. <laughs> nothing can be more terrifying than God to allow someone to have their sinful heart's desire fulfilled. And that's, again, you know, the worst and fairest punishment God can give a person is to allow them their sinful heart's deepest desire. And again, think about this for a moment. We, in our world today, accept a certain level of greed, pride, lust, anger, bitterness is perfectly normal. Right? I mean, just yeah, that's just how we are. Right? That's human. But we kind of veil it, kind of cover it a little way, put it into kind of different packaging so maybe it doesn't seem so bad after all. But what happens when that is completely unveiled? What happens when everyone just takes the cover off? And that you are then to allowed to grow in that, unchecked by God and His grace. What happens when everyone then is just justified to feel and act however they wish? My friends, if you value pride, greed, anger, way, your way, your truth, your body, your life, right? The more than his, you'll get it. That's what, that's what he teaches us. You'll get it. And that attitude destroys life. It destroys joy. It robs us of hope. And it's what's called hell. The, 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 the teaching of scriptures that hell's actually locked first from the inside. From the inside. J.A. Packer put it this way. Scripture sees hell as self-chosen. Hell appears as God's gesture of respect for human choice. All receive what they actually chose. Either to be with God forever, worshiping him, or without God forever, worshiping themselves. It's just a natural consequence of what you've chosen. If you want God as your Savior, as your Lord and your, as your Master, oh, you'll get him. And the wonder, the glory is beyond anything we can imagine. If you fight against it, if you want to be your own savior, your own master, the captain of your fate, the master of your soul, you'll get that too. I saw this in this this week. Watched it with the kiddos, right? The Grinch got it. I mean, think about it. He was surrounded by love. One of the happiest places on earth. And he hated it, fought to destroy it, didn't want anything to do with it. And he was miserable and would have stayed miserable until Cindy Lou Who <laughs> broke into his life and showed him another way. And he was converted, transformed. And that heart that was three sizes too small began to grow. You know, this, uh, I mean, a childish way of understanding something far deeper that's going on all around us and that threatens each and every one of us. And, and, and then the, finally, then that, that, that last thing that the doctrine held is important because it actually tells us, shows us how much Jesus has done for you and for me. Because if Jesus doesn't save us from something, what does he save us from? Nothing? From being not nice? From unpleasant thoughts? From the wrong side of the political aisle, whichever side that is? I mean, what does he save us from? That's what he said over and over he was doing. I mean, listen again to these words of Jeremiah, how deserted lies the city, once so full of people. 
how like a widow is she who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. After affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her. In the midst of her distress, the Lord has done what he planned. He has fulfilled his word, which he decreed long ago. He has overthrown you without pity. He has let the enemy gloat over you. He has exalted the horn, the strength of your foes. I mean, those opening verses, and I encourage you to go home and read the rest of Lamentations. It's brutal. It's destruction. It's death. It's, it's just, the suffering is immense. It's the natural consequence of them fighting against the one who created the universe. And it's interesting that, that Jeremiah, throughout his immense suffering and sorrow, says, yet this I call to mind. And therefore, I have hope. Because you see, no matter the depths of his ministry, God is actually deeper still. No matter the darkness of our sinful, evil choices, Jesus has plunged even deeper into those depths. He has borne our griefs, Isaiah told us, right? Carried our sorrows. On him was the chastisement, the brokenness, the punishment, the judgment that was to be ours. When you begin to understand this, you begin to understand that Jesus' suffering on the cross was not three to six hours of physical pain. That's nothing. That's nothing. You and I can endure that. You don't want to, but you and I could endure that part of it. What actually wrecked Jesus was taking on the sin of the world and feeling then the separation of the holy and righteous Father that he had been with for all eternity. I mean, we hear the laments of Jeremiah and the other prophets in this destruction, and and, and they are brutal. The pain is awful and real. The heartbreak is immense, and yet it is nothing. It is absolutely nothing compared to what Jesus experienced when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, look at it this way. We have relationships, right? Right? Now, if you have someone at work who kind of snubs you, you know, or does something kind of mean or, you know, thoughtless of you, I mean, it often bothers us, right? For a little while, but then we go home and whatever. But if a good friend just drops you, right, just kind of writes you out of their life, that hurts. And what happens when a spouse says something like, I don't want anything to do with you anymore? Or a parent says, I'm done. You are dead to me. What does that feel like? That takes months, maybe even years to get over, if ever. So what happens when the father and son who have loved and celebrated each other for all eternity are separated on the cross because of the sin that is poured over Jesus? What did that feel like for our Lord and our Savior? There are no words. There are no words to describe what he endured for you and for me. And we are told over and over again that he did that willingly so that you and I can be with him for all eternity. Now, I get it. We might not like to think of this. It's not pleasant. It, it, it exposes all kinds of things in us and in our world that we have just accepted as okay. You might actually even prefer a God of sentimental gooeyness 
whose idea of love does not include sacrifice. We all know people, I have loved ones in my life who struggle with this mightily. You can find plenty of so-called churches who go that road. But real love serves. Real love sacrifices. Real love embraces pain for another. And that's what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. That's the love that has redeemed and saved us. Because of the Lord's great love, great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Remember, Lord, what has happened to us. Look and see our disgrace. Joy is gone from our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. You, Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old. God's mercy is new to us each and every morning because of what Jesus has done for us. The God who endured the suffering on the cross is not going to reject those who humble themselves and pray and seek his healing and forgiveness. He does not. In fact, he pours it out day after day after day. He is going to be then with us to the most awful of times, and he is going to celebrate us with us in our joy. See, Christ has conquered to save us from sin and death and hell. There is victory in him. His mercy is new each day. His faithfulness is great. It is yours, offered to you freely each day. And so let us daily repent Believe in this gospel, this good news of what God has done for us in his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for what you have done. And um, help us, Lord, not to get caught up in the climate and philosophies of our day that reject who you are and what you have done for us, that are seeking ways to get out of turning back to you, repenting of our sinful brokenness and rebellion. Lord God, fill us with humility. Turn us to you. Help us to repent. Help us then to also receive your great mercy poured out new each and every morning. Let it strengthen us, filling us with hope, filling us with a real joy that lasts for eternity. And help us, Lord God, with love to share this good news with those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.